The Russian mountaineer Anatoly Bukreyev once wrote, the mountains are not the stadium where I practice my ambition to achieve. They are the cathedrals where I practice my religion. It's not hard to get a sense of the sacred up here in the mountains, but it's a sense of the sacred that's often missing in our ordinary lives down below. Sayyid Hossein Nasser invites us to imagine what it might be like to imbue a sense of the sacred to the life we lead down below the clouds. In late 1966, the historian Lynn White gave an address entitled The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis. And this address was published as an article in the journal Science in the following year. Now, this article is taken as one of the early influential texts in the modern environmental movement. And White there makes an argument that has gained a lot of currency in environmental thinking, that there is something deep in Western thought that leads us to a destructive relationship with the environment. And in particular, White traces the roots to Christianity and more specifically medieval Western Christianity. But he finds the roots right there in the Bible. In the first book of Genesis, you have God creating the human being in God's image and then giving human beings dominion over the plants and the animals of the earth. So there's an entire Christian culture that draws on this idea that we are different from the rest of nature in that we are created in God's image, and that insofar as we are created in God's image, we also have a certain amount of authority over all of the other things in the world, that we can treat them as means to our ends. And this idea, which obviously is part of the Jewish Bible as well, gains a particular emphasis in the Christian tradition where Jesus is God made flesh, so when God comes among us, God takes on a human form, lending an even stronger anthropocentric uh, tendency to Christian thinking. And White argues that uh, Western medieval Christianity takes this even further, that uh, the harsher climate of Europe required more invasive uh, uses of the land than in the milder and easier to harvest climates of the Middle East where uh, Christianity and Judaism had their roots. So White thinks that there is something deep in Western culture that leads us to take a destructive attitude toward the environment. But you can find similar forms of anthropocentrism, I think, in many religious and spiritual traditions. So for example, the scholar Ian Harris has found a certain anthropocentric anti-environmental trend in early Indian Buddhism as well. And I think the thing that is common to a lot of religions is the idea that there is something more to human existence than our natural, physical, bodily existence. That there's often this idea of some kind of transcendence, that we are more than what we physically are. And that can lead, first of all, to a sense that what is most important about us is the part of us that transcends nature, so that the natural world is less in importance. And that also often comes with a kind of a contempt for the body, for the flesh, for our physical existence, that can bleed into a kind of disdain for all things physical and natural. Sayyid Hussein Nasser is just one of a number of scholars who pushes back against this idea that religion is at the root of our ecological crisis. Nasser says, Actually, the opposite is true. That is secularization and the move away from religion that has led us into a destructive relationship with the environment. And the thinking goes like this, that in a religious worldview, the world as a whole is created by God and exists in an order that was established by God. And it's because all of the plants and animals and rivers and mountains around us were created by God that they are sacred and they need to be honored because they are part of God's creation. But if you take God out of the picture, then the plants and the animals and the rivers and the mountains are just things, and they can exist as means to serve human ends. What's more, if you take God out of the picture, human interests then become of paramount importance. That on a religious worldview, human beings exist as God's creation in order to honor and worship God. And that means that our interests are subordinate to the interests of God, that what we want ultimately has to submit itself to the will of God. But if there is no God to submit our will to, then our will becomes the thing that is most important. There's nothing more important than our own interests for us to serve. And what's more, Nasser suggests 
the yearning for God, the need for God, is something that fills us with an infinite amount of desire that can only be satisfied by union with an infinite being. But if we deny the existence of this infinite being, we still have that infinite yearning, that infinite thirst, and that turns into an infinite greed that leads us to a destructive uh, plundering of the natural environment so that we can acquire more and more stuff. Now, somewhat provocatively, Nasser takes modern science to be a big culprit in this, that he takes modern science to be uh, one of the foremost manifestations of this human acquisitiveness, this desire to know, to master, and to control things. Now, it's worth noting that Nasser is not speaking from a position of ignorance. He has a degree in physics from MIT. He did a PhD in the history of science at Harvard. So he has a, a scientific training. And it's not science itself that is the problem for him, so much as what you might call scientism. The idea that science is the best or the only uh, or the most authoritative source of knowledge. And you might say that what Nasser wants to do is to tame science, to uh, subordinate it to what he sometimes calls the scientia sacra, the sacred science of understanding God, of theology, you might say. And in doing so, he is hearkening back to a medieval conception of the sciences, and in particular one that had a lot of currency in Islamic philosophy. And it's worth noting that um, contrary to the idea that science really got started in the early modern period with a bunch of people in the 17th century doing crazy things that went against the sort of old medieval superstition, um, there was actually a lot of scientific work in the medieval world, and in particular, Islamic world, was uh, making all sorts of strides in developing new scientific discoveries, especially in medicine. Um, but the thought is that in uh, medieval science, the thought was that what we're doing when we're studying the natural world is we're studying God's creation, that this is a way of getting clear on the mind of God, and that all of the scientific research is not independent of an interest in the mind of God. Uh, and so there's this higher knowledge, this higher science, an understanding of God and God's creation that is above our scientific understanding. And what's more is not one that can be exper uh, uh, explored through empirical investigation. You're not going to run a bunch of experiments to figure out what God is like. You can run a bunch of experiments to figure out things about God's creation, which might then give you an insight into the nature of God but fundamentally understanding God is a different kind of investigation. And so on this medieval conception, empirical science has its place, but that place is a subordinate one. And Nasser thinks that in the same way that human beings in a secularized world have gotten too big for their britches, that they've sort of taken the place that God once held as the most important being in the cosmos, he also thinks that the same thing has happened with science, where it was once a subordinate form of study that was subordinated to the study of God, and now it has become the paramount form of knowing, so that we take scientific knowledge to be the paradigm for what it is to know anything at all. So Nasser draws a contrast between what he calls Promethean man and pontifical man. So Promethean man is modern man. We are the, the descendants of Prometheus who stole the fire of the gods and gave it to us so that we could become more powerful, more creative, more energetic. Pontifical man is Nasser's way of describing human beings as what he calls a pontifex, which is Latin for bridge builder, that we exist as a bridge between the divine and the natural, that human beings, through our worship of God, our praise of God, our ritualistic practices, work to sustain and maintain an order that was created by God. And so our proper place in the cosmos is not one of the Promethean scientific figure who shapes the world according to their interests, but in a humbler role of bridge builder, of sustaining an order that is not ours, not our creation, but one in which we have an important role to play. And all of this, I think, is quite striking in the way that Nasser shares with many other radical ecologists the idea that what we need to do to heal our planet is to find a new way of understanding our place in relation to nature. You find this idea in deep ecology, in ecofeminism, uh, in Murray Bookchin's social ecology even. 
But instead of saying that we need to find some new way of relating to the natural world, Nasser is saying, we already had a way of relating to the natural world. We lost it. We need to get it back. And he's saying, what we need is not some kind of new spiritual reckoning. We need an old one. We need to get back to religion, which might seem like a retrograde and reactionary response to the ecological crisis. But since we're talking about conservation of the natural world, perhaps a conservative approach isn't such a bad one after all.